and we're going to be ready for them. In Jesus' name. Well, today, we're going to read the menu. Now, 30 or so years ago, if I'd have said in a, in a, in a sermon that we're going to read the menu, I mean, back before the electronic age, before computers and cell phones and smartphones and tablets, uh, the menu, you'd say, well, I don't want to just read the menu. I want to eat the meal. And let me say the word is a meal. Jesus did say, you know, eat, eat it and, and drink it. So that's, that's your personal uh, choice on that, whether you take this word and, and make it meat and drink in your life or whether it is just rhetoric. But no, I'm using menu now in the, in the postmodern sense. And that is uh, like, okay, here's my cell phone. Okay, and when I open it, it's this old-timey cell phone. Y'all got the fancy kind now. But right down here at the lower right-hand corner is a thing that says menu. So I press that, and here comes all kinds of little icons, which are images, right? Okay, and then you select, you know, if you want to send a text message, you select that one, or if you want to see the people on your address book, you select that one, or if you want to go to the Internet, you select that one. But this is your menu. And, and it takes you to places uh, that, that are, are an image. I think you know where we're going with this, don't you? You know, it says that as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so shall we and so let us bear the image of the man of heaven. So we are going to read the menu of God's word here. And... I will also say that I have not fully uh, digested the, the impact of what God is going to show us today. As you see on the cover of your song sheet, we are going to talk about the power of Jesus' resurrection. That's, that's what we're talking about today. The power of his resurrection. And I have not plumbed the depths of that, and I don't know anyone that has. But it's on the menu. It, it's something we can click into and that we can receive when we need it. And we're going to talk about some of the ways that we do that today, the power of his resurrection. So, Father, I thank you for revealing this to us by your spirit that this will not be limited by my power of speech or our power of understanding, but you, by your Holy Spirit, will reveal to us on an ongoing basis the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that does in and for each of us who believe in Jesus' name. Start, let's go to John chapter 1. In the beginning, you know, this is an interesting thing because the Old Testament begins with those words, in the beginning. And this Gospel of John begins with those words, in the beginning. And the Amplified says that that would be before all time. Well, it was before all space. It was before all matter. It was before anything that we are familiar with. In the beginning. Now, let me just throw this in here. Just for your consideration. There's a lot that we don't know about. And we operate our lives as if we do know about pretty much everything. And I believe what looking at the power of Jesus' resurrection, if nothing else, it will help us realize that there are things our mind can't comprehend. There's things out there that are going to blow people's minds. 
And we're fixing to experience it in the here and now in this realm. And God is telling us these things so that, that we will know things that the greatest scientists alive today do not know. So to start talking about in the beginning was the word. Now there's two words in Greek for word. One is logos, which is what is used here. The other one is rhema, which means spoken word. You could say it this way. The, the rhema word is when the word begins to be heard, when it begins to be felt, when it begins to be registered. But before that, it is the logos. And, and God is, as it says in the Bible, self-existent. He is eternal. He doesn't need any of us to be God. He doesn't need people to believe in him. He doesn't need people to love him. He loves us. And he wants us to love him so we will benefit. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our devotion. He doesn't need our worship. We are the ones that benefit that. As the song said that we sang, the sweet, sweet spirit, you're the one that will profit when you say, I'm going with Jesus all the way. Because if you say, no, Lord, I'm not going to do it, you're not hampering God's style at all. <laughs> you're just, you're just uh, robbing yourself of the blessing. Anyway, before everything was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. Now, I want you to keep the place here in John, because we're going to refer back to this later. But I want you to go now to Hebrews chapter 1. In the beginning of Hebrews, it, it's another one of those in the beginning places. I think there is a, a correlation. There's some dots to be connected between Genesis 1.1, John 1.1, and Hebrews 1.1 that we are going to connect here. Hebrews 1 verse 1. In many separate revelations, I'll read this in the Amplified, each of which set forth a portion of the truth, and in different ways, God spoke of old to our forefathers in and by the prophets. But in the last of these days, he has spoken to us in the person of a son, whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things, also by and through whom he created the worlds, the reaches of space, the ages of time. He made, produced, built, operated, and arranged them in order. You know, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. He is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being the outraying or the radiance of the divine. He is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature. Who are we talking about here? We're talking about Jesus. And it says that he is upholding, maintaining, guiding, and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. So the word of God is powerful. I believe most of you know this little tidbit of Greek. You know, say, well, it's all Greek to me. Well, y'all are learning Greek here. You know what? I, I hope you appreciate the Greek that you know. Because the word power is the word dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite and dynamic, which has to do with according to Strong's Concordance, power, ability, efficiency, 
and might. And it also has to do with possibility. You know, there are, there are things that man doesn't even consider possible when the scriptures say nothing is impossible with God. So we are not accustomed to living a life where anything is possible. In fact, we're really kind of trained to not live that way because, you know, to, to children, they... Um, especially those that have grown up with television and movies and this and that, they see things that are, that are done in fiction and they, they treat that as if it's uh, the six o'clock news. Of course, the truth of the matter of that is the six o'clock news can be fiction too. But be that as it may, uh, we train children that, okay, you've got to, quote, live in the real world. Well, let me tell you, the real world is not all there is. There, there is amazing things that the real world is not presenting to you because our minds are limited. Our perceptions are limited. Our perceptions are, are guided and propelled and controlled not by the word of God anymore. I mean, not that they ever were really, but certainly today, less than ever in history, man's thinking is guided by uh, man's systems which are guided by guess who the devil so you are not allowed by the system to know what is possible and they are doing a lot of things that you might say are not possible uh, but they are doing them behind uh, you know at what you talked about the the Guadalupe River they're doing it an, an undercurrent below the surface you say well how is that possible with God, all things are possible. All right? Keep the place here. Go to Acts chapter 1. We need to kick some of the boundaries of our thinking out. As it says in Isaiah 54, we need to, to uh, lengthen the cords of our tent. We, we need to make the boundaries of our habitation bigger. And I know you realtors would like that. Okay. All right. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This was the last thing that Jesus told his disciples before he ascended to the Father. In verse 8, in the Amplified Bible, it says... You shall receive dunamis, power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So that's where that power comes from with us human beings is from the Holy Spirit. It's not as humanists and New Agers would tell you something that is, is within every man and you just have to tap into it. Now let me say, there probably are some supernatural things within every man that if you tap into, that you will see things that you didn't know were possible. I mean, anybody doing karate can tell you that. But those things are not God. Those things are not the Holy Spirit. They are of another spirit. But he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he says, you will receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends and the very bounds of the earth. That's what he's talking about back in Hebrews 1. Go back there. When he talks about upholding, guiding and propelling all things by his word of power. Now, there's another interesting meaning of that word upholding. Now, we just read over there in Acts where he told the disciples to, to go out into all the world with this uh, message that he has, has given them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, that word upholding actually 
it, it's a very simple word in Greek. It just means to carry. It means, okay, you, you're given something and you carry it. All of y'all came in here, you ladies came in here with a purse. And all of you, as far as I can tell, came in here with a Bible. You carried that in here. Okay, that's all God is saying. He says, what I am, the, the power that I am going to give to you, Jesus gave to his disciples, and he's given to us too, because we're his disciples, right? We are just to carry that. We don't have to manipulate it. We don't even have to dissect it or understand it, even though I do a lot of that. You don't have to. You've just got to carry it. Now, I do believe it's important for you to study to show yourself approved, to rightly divide the Word of God, because if you don't, the devil is good at wrongly dividing the Word of God and making doctrines, dogmas, and creeds that are actually contrary to God's will. But once you have received from the Holy Spirit a revelation, then carry it. Put that in your uh, memory bank. Put that in your library, in your strong box of valuables. Carry it with you. And that is what is described. Keep the place here in Hebrews 1. Go to Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 21 says, no prophecy, and a prophecy means a word from the Lord. We had a prophecy this morning. What I'm doing basically is giving you a prophecy, a word from the Lord. No word from the Lord ever originated because some man willed it to do so. That's not to say men don't will to bring forth words, but it's not from the Lord then, it's from them. You know, a, a man can stand up in a pulpit and say, well, thus says the Lord, give me all your money. Right? Well, who was talking there? You know, I'll give you three guesses and the first two don't count. Right? That, that was coming from that man's spirit. And there, look, there are a lot. And... and Let's don't throw rocks. I mean, it's kind of easy to do. It's kind of easy when you know uh, something of, of the Lord for you to think that when you, you speak forth, well, this is what the Lord wants, or this is what he says, or this is how he feels about something. You know, he thinks you're supposed to vote Republican, or he thinks you're supposed to do this or that. Well, that's you. That's not really God. I mean, I'm not saying God couldn't tell you who to vote for. And I'm not saying God can't speak through you, but it's hard for us to tell sometimes. And this is part of the things that come with spiritual maturity. But the men of old says, no prophecy ever originated because some man willed it. It never came by human impulse, but men spoke from God who were born along, that's that same word as upheld, guided and propelled. The same thing that God does with Mer Mercury and Venus and Mars and Jupiter, he did with the prophets of old. He propels, he guides, he directs. That they were born along, moved and impelled. They were carried by the Holy Spirit. See, I want us to be carried by the Holy Spirit. I want to be carried by the Holy Spirit. Okay, back to Hebrews one it says, when he, by offering himself, accomplished our cleansing of sin and riddance of guilt, he sat down at the right hand of the divine majesty on high. The Greek word there is actually two words. Uh, that, that's, that the Amplified has called cleansing our sin, riddance of guilt. It actually means to make uh, clean or to accomplish a cleansing. Now, this is, this is an interesting thing, and, and this has gotten twisted a lot of ways. Uh, th this has gotten twisted to the idea that, well, okay, Jesus, Jesus bore everybody's sins, so everybody's going to heaven. Well, that's a twisting. 
Okay, and, and the truth of the matter is, Jesus did bear everybody's sins, past, present, and future. He bore our sins. Keep the place. Go to Romans chapter 8. Our sins he carried. He carried them away. Never to be remembered against us anymore by God. Well then, how, then on, by on what basis then would God judge whether somebody was worthy of heaven or worthy of hell? By one basis. And that is what do we do with Jesus? Do we believe in him? Do we accept him as who he says he is? As the son of God? As, as that who, who uh, spoke the worlds into being and upholds and guides and maintains the universe by his word? Do we believe that and do we uh, live according to that understanding or, or not? Or is he just a man that had some good ideas but we've got good ideas too and we're going to live by our ideas. Thank you very much then that, that gets you judged by God. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are, where, what? In Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ Jesus, there is condemnation. And who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, let me say this. As far as, our, as Jesus bearing our sins is concerned, when you sin, you've got the promise, 1 John 1, 9. If we sin, he is faithful and just. He forgives your sin. He will cleanse you of unrighteousness. But there is one that will condemn you if you sin. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's the devil. And so if you're walking according to the flesh, the devil is going to condemn you. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. We didn't make ourselves free from the law of sin and death by living good lives. We couldn't do that. Nobody could do that. Nobody could live a sinless life. And that's why God became a man because he can do the impossible. He can be a man living a sinless life. So he did it. And that's what sets us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, I used to read that, and I used to think that, that God was giving me something in the advertisement and taking it away in the fine print. I used to, to read that and say, well, okay, Jesus died for my sins, so I can stand before God free of sin. But I better not sin anymore or, uh, or he's, he's mad at me or he's going to take, you know, that privilege away from me. You know, that's what it says. If you, if you don't walk according to the Spirit, then you're walking according to the flesh, then there's condemnation. Well, let's understand here what he's talking about. Walking in the Spirit is us tapping into Jesus. When he says we are in Christ, that doesn't just mean that we are in a church. Or it doesn't just mean that we are in a religion or in a philosophy or a belief system. It means that as our faith has laid hold of what Jesus has done for us, then his life, the law of the spirit of life is in us. If, if we are in him, then he is in us. 
It's simple. If we're walking in the Spirit, we're not going to sin. Now, fortunately, if we're walking in the flesh and we do sin, He's paid for it. Go back and thank Him for that. All the sins. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. See, walking in the Spirit is how the resurrection power of Jesus Christ becomes available to us. We're not going to get that walking in the flesh. You're only going to get that walking in the Spirit. Now, I know all of you have prayed for miracles to happen. And maybe we've not seen uh, as, as much positive result on that as we'd like to see, but I know every one of you has had an answer to prayer, that you have prayed in faith to Jesus and, and God did it. Well, then you were walking in the Spirit and the resurrection power of Jesus Christ accomplished that answer to prayer. That's what we're talking about here. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is that Jesus died for our sins. For it is, the gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Well, I believe most of you know salvation doesn't just cover you go into heaven instead of going to hell. Salvation covers healing. It covers your needs being met. It, give, it covers uh, peace of mind. Whatever you need from God, salvation is the answer. And it comes from Jesus through you believing. So that's what we're talking about back here in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. It says, when he offered himself and cleansed our sin and ridded us from guilt. That's part of, his resur part of what his resurrection did for us. Yes, I know that's what his dying on the cross did for us. But his resurrection from the dead opened the way for us to experience that. Now, forgiveness of sin, one of you, Steve, I don't remember if it was you or it was Tom, one of you was talking about how um, healing requires forgiveness of sin. Uh, keep the place here, go to Luke chapter 5. There was a graphic demonstration of that fact right here. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day, as Jesus was teaching, that there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town in Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. This was a big meeting. And the power, the dunamis of the Lord was present to heal. And then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. But they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. So they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven. Well, wait a minute. He came for healing, but what he got was forgiveness of his sins. Well, that's what accomplished the healing. See, there's, there's a whole, there's a whole backstory to the human condition uh, having to do with our physical makeup and, and why our bodies um, die, why our bodies become subject to allergies or to diseases, or why 
uh, there are inherited uh, hereditary curses that, that come upon man. But Jesus died for all of that. There, there, he healed all of their diseases. He does. Psalm 103 promises that. Anyway, so verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying, well, who is this one that